Let's take a look at a verse that is certainly a contender for being one of the most stupid in the whole of the New Testament, and that's saying something. It's Luke 23, 44. Here's how the King James Bible renders the verse. And it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Just to make sure we get that point, the very next verse adds, And the sun was darkened. Imagine that, darkness over the whole earth for three hours. Our oldest extant Bible, the Codex Sinaiticus from the 4th century, clarifies that the sun had failed. And the Catholic Jerusalem Bible assures us that the sun had been eclipsed. So here we have a claim in the Gospel of Luke that one of the signs or portents at the crucifixion of Jesus was a darkness affecting the whole earth lasting for three hours and caused by a failure or perhaps an eclipse of the sun. It's quite an extraordinary claim. And even more extraordinary that in the great civilizations of the time, Roman, Persian and Chinese, no one noticed or recorded this startling and frightening event. Now I suppose an omnipotent God could arrange anything, even worldwide amnesia. But in the normal universe... This verse from Luke is plain stupid on so many different levels. For a start, no eclipse of the sun can last longer than around seven minutes, so three hours is quite a stretch. Christian apologists have always had a struggle to defend the darkness claim. They not infrequently turn to a lunar eclipse which can last rather longer than a solar eclipse, but actually occurs only at night, to try to justify the gospel's daytime darkness. As an exercise in damage limitation, many translations of the gospel replace all the earth with all the land, with the added inference that only the land of Judea was affected. Even so, many determined defenders of the faith have been reluctant to concede the literal truth of the Gospels. And yet, all the portents of the crucifixion were literary devices, embellishments included to emphasise the cosmic importance of their Jesus tale. Many apologists, both ancient and modern, have insisted that it was a darkness that embraced the whole world. As it happened, chroniclers of the ancient world were very interested in what were considered to be supernatural happenings. Therefore, an unprecedented darkness affecting even part of the earth should have captured their interest. So it is most unfortunate for the Christians that all the important chroniclers of the age recorded not a word. Pliny the Elder, for example, writing 37 books of natural history in the second half of the first century, claimed to have gathered 20,000 facts from the works of 400 authors. And Pliny knew that the sun was immense, that the world was a sphere, and he wrote extensively about eclipses and what he called celestial prodigies. Pliny even wrote chapters on Idumea, Palestinia, Samaria and Judea. Yet nowhere does Pliny speak of the supposed preternatural darkness. Nor is any word of the darkness forthcoming from the noted 2nd century astronomer-geographer of Alexandria, Claudius Ptolemy, whose Almagest was a veritable compendium of ancient knowledge of the heavens, was influential for more than a thousand years. 
nor was the darkness known to Philo, Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, or any other luminary whom we might quite reasonably expect to have heard of or known of any extraordinary darkness, if it was anything other than a religious fable. Unable to garner support from respected authors, yet Desperate to justify their crucifixion miracles, early Christian apologists turned to misrepresenting the work of two obscure ancient authors whose writings are no longer extant. Origen of Alexandria, a prolific Christian writer in the first half of the 3rd century, in responding to the charge made in the previous century by the pagan philosopher Celsus that the earthquake and the darkness were a fantastic tale, Origen invoked the name of Phlegon. Now, Phlegon had also lived a century before Origen. He had been a freedman of the Emperor Hadrian. So Origen was not referencing any eyewitness, though evidently Hadrian's servant did write a chronicle. These are the words of Origen in Contra Celsus, and concerning the eclipse in the time of Tiberius Caesar, during whose reign Jesus appears to have been crucified, and about the great earthquakes that happened at that time. Phlegon has also made a record in the 13th or 14th book, I think, of his chronicles. Note that Origen merely asserts vaguely that Phlegon confirmed the Christian claims, but does not quote the words that Phlegon may actually have written. And Origen was no lukewarm Christian. Reputedly, he castrated himself out of fidelity to Jesus and the words of Matthew 19.12. Even Origen argued in his commentary on Matthew that the darkness had affected only Judea, based upon the logic that all the other signs had been local and therefore the darkness was local too. Around the time that Origen was invoking the name of Phlegon, another defender of the faith, Sextus Julius Africanus, was citing his own dead, but even more obscure pagan writer, Thallus. He says, Thallus, in the third book of his histories, explains away the darknesses of the eclipse of the sun, unreasonably as it seems to me. However, note again that this quotation itself only known from the work of a 9th century Byzantine writer, comes from the pen of the Christian Julius Africanus and not the pagan Thallus, and it fails to link that pagan writer with the crucifixion. When Theophilus of Antioch had mentioned Thallus 50 years earlier, the bishop had made no connection between the pagan writer and the darkness of the crucifixion. A few years later, at the very end of the 2nd century, the pugnacious apologist of Carthage, Tertullian, defended the darkness of the sun not by any reference to Phallus, but the bizarre assertion that the wonder was preserved in the Roman archives. The most probable explanation is that Phallus may indeed have written about an eclipse, which pagan authors frequently did. But it was Africanus who falsely connected the eclipse of Phallus with the Jesus tale. A later apologist than either Origen or Africanus, the illustrious Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea in the early 4th century, also referred to Phlegon in his own chronicle. This time it seems that Phlegon's actual words were cited, though having passed through the hands of two ardent partisans of Christ, they have doubtless acquired a Christian gloss. Quote, now in the fourth year that a 202nd Olympiad, a great eclipse of the sun occurred at the sixth hour, that excelled every other before it, turning the day into such darkness of night that the stars could be seen in heaven, and the earth moved in Bithynia, toppling many buildings in the city of Nicaea. Eusebius possibly had Thallus in mind when he also wrote that other Greek compendiums had used the word the sun was eclipsed, Bithynia was struck by an earthquake, 
and in the city of Nicaea many buildings fell. Notice how far we have strayed from Judea and the crucifixion. Nicaea is more than a thousand miles from Jerusalem, and there's nothing at all unusual about an earthquake in Bithynia. That region of northwest Turkey has frequently been struck by earthquake, most recently 2011. In 1999, 20,000 people died in an earthquake here, which like all the others, had nothing at all to do with Jesus. Now, pagan authors knew perfectly well that eclipses weren't arbitrary events and that earthquakes were all too familiar. It was almost inevitable that somewhere on the surface of the globe, such events would have occurred around the vaguely understood time of the crucifixion. It was the Christians who were befuddled desperate to support their fable with historical evidence, which was nowhere apparent. So apologists shamelessly seized upon the work of any pagan writer with a malleable reference to shout, there you are, it really happened. Yet the absurdity of the Christian claims was there in the beginning, in the Gospels themselves. A solar eclipse, as the ancients knew, is caused by an alignment of the sun, the earth and the moon on those rare occasions when the moon is perfectly aligned between the sun and the earth. The dark side of the moon faces towards the earth, briefly blotting out the sun's light. The moon casts its shadow onto the earth and is itself in its dark or so-called new moon phase. The event does not last long, and it only ever affects a small part of the Earth. But as a sign of the crucifixion, a solar eclipse of any duration is a non-starter, because the other claim found in Luke 22.1 and elsewhere is that the dramatic events of the crucifixion had taken place at Passover. Now the Passover requires not a new moon, but a full moon. In fact, that is how the festival of the Passover is determined, by reference to the first full moon occurring after the spring equinox. To the Jews, it was the midpoint, the 15th day, of the month of Nisan. In reality, of course, one half of the moon is always illuminated by the sun. But viewed from the earth, often we can see only part of that illuminated surface, in the shape of various crescents or partial moons. But around once a month, we get to see the moon's completely illuminated surface, a full moon. On these occasions, the moon is further from the sun than the earth. Or put another way, the earth is between the moon and the sun. At regular intervals, the moon actually passes into the shadow of the earth in what is called a lunar eclipse and is partially obscured. Occasionally, the moon will pass into the very darkest part of the earth's shadow in an event called a total lunar eclipse, although even then scattered sunlight will reach the moon, giving it a reddish colour and hence the name blood moon. Simply put, a new moon and a full moon cannot occur at the same time and it is impossible to have an eclipse of the sun at the time of the Passover festival. And even the smarter early Christians knew that perfectly well. Whereas the earliest manuscripts of Luke read that the sun's light failed or the sun was in eclipse, later manuscripts were corrected to maintain that only the sun was darkened. Some apologists also interpreted the words of the Gospel with a certain latitude. For them, the darkness was a miracle arranged by God and was not an event that pagan astronomers might have mistakenly identified as a regular eclipse of the sun, or did so only out of a stubborn refusal to accept the divine miracle. But what are the three-hour duration to be read in three of the Gospels? John's Gospel doesn't mention the darkness at all. If you recall the chronology of the crucifixion, Jesus was nailed to his cross at the third hour, that is 9am. So why did he hang for three hours in perfectly normal sunlight before the onset of the darkness? Was there anything special about noon, the so-called sixth hour? 
The ancients viewed noon in rather the same way that, until the modern era, the superstitious viewed midnight. Midnight was the beginning of the witching hour, when ghosts and dark and malevolent forces were at large. In the ancient world, it was when the sun was at its highest that the gods often made their awesome presence known. The Jews were not exempt from this belief. For example, it was at noon that Elijah began to mock the priests of Baal and taunt them with the power of Yahweh. According to the prophet Jeremiah, it was a destroyer at noon that was sent by the Lord Yahweh to punish the apostasy of Jerusalem. It was at noon that the Apostle Paul supposedly had his epiphany on the road to Damascus. And it was at noon that Peter fell into his trance and heard the voice of God telling him to kill and eat all sorts of animals. Noon was auspicious, and it was in one of the minor prophets, the book of Amos, that the gospel writers found at least part of their template for the signs of the crucifixion. The soothsayer who wrote Amos was among the first to write of the day of the Lord, and he wrote, On that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like the morning for an only sun. Of course, whoever wrote Amos didn't have a crucifixion in mind centuries into the future. The supposed prophet was chastising the destroyed northern kingdom of Israel from the safety of the southern kingdom of Judah denouncing the northerners' neglect of Lord Yahweh as the reason for their conquest by the Assyrians. Yet here was a day of the Lord's sign of noontime darkness, a useful element for the gospel writers. For that matter, Amos also wrote of an earthquake, of judgment turned to gall, of fleeing away naked, all elements to be found in the gospel narrative. The author of Matthew returned to the text of Amos to find justification for adding his earthquake. Shall not the land tremble, said the ancient soothsayer, in the line immediately preceding his darkness prophecy? But what of the claim that the darkness lasted until the ninth hour, that is 3 p.m.? Well, as Josephus, the Jewish historian, confirms, the Jews observed both a morning sacrifice at the third hour and an afternoon sacrifice at the ninth hour. And Jesus, of course, the very Lamb of God, superseded and displaced both Jewish sacrifices. It should be very apparent by now that the signs of the crucifixion were not remembered events from history but were recycled motifs drawn from Jewish scripture. Old ideas and notions simply reworked by a new generation of storytellers. Apart from the earthquake and the darkness, another sign was the tearing of the veil of the temple from top to bottom at the moment of Jesus' death. Josephus tells us that this was a huge and costly curtain, more than 60 feet high, heavily embroidered and a hand breadth in thickness. The symbolism of this rending of the veil is palpable. The curtain with which the Jews had kept sacrosanct Yahweh's sanctuary on earth, a presence in the Holy of Holies, in Christian reinterpretation, had denied direct access to God. The rending of the veil, the death of Jesus, was a single cosmic event. God was now made accessible through faith in Christ. But could the tearing of the curtain also have been a real event? Hardly, considering sacrifices and festivals at the Jewish temple continued for another 40 years after the supposed catastrophe of its tearing. No observer writes of any repairs to the gigantic drapery, and note also how awkwardly this portent appears in Mark's Gospel. Verse 1538 has been intruded between two lines that read better without it. 
Mark's Gospel has simply been amended to harmonise with the later and more embellished Gospel of Matthew. Now Matthew of course added miracles like the earthquake quite unreported by Mark or any other evangelist. The most notorious embellishment is to be found in Matthew verse 27-52. Itself a contender for the most stupid verse in the whole New Testament. Jesus dies, the vowel of the temple is torn in two, an earthquake splits rocks, and then the tombs of the saints are opened and the saints are returned to life. These bizarre words, unique to Matthew, are based not on real events, of course, but entirely upon claims lifted out of context from Jewish scripture. In the prophetic writings, a great many events are anticipated as occurring on a nebulous day of the Lord. Isaiah had promised that your dead shall live, your body shall rise. Ezekiel had specifically stated, Thus said the Lord God, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. The book attributed to Zechariah, one of the last of the minor prophets, foresaw the splitting rocks of the ancient graveyard on the Mount of Olives. Enoch gave the assurance, and those who have been destroyed return and stay themselves on the day of the elect one. Daniel's vision spoke of the vindication of the saints. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Matthew took obvious delight into weaving all these various motifs into his revision of Mark's original story. But the chronology he created was a bit sloppy, creating a conflict with another claim also drawn from Scripture that the risen Lord would be the first fruit of the resurrection. Jesus was the replacement for all the Jewish festivals, and the feast of the first fruit followed immediately after the Passover sacrifice. Hence, Jesus was himself the first fruit. But if the saints were restored to life as a sign of the cosmic importance of the crucifixion, then Jesus himself could not have been the first fruit of the resurrection. No wonder that no other gospel writer followed Matthew's lead on the saints. To preserve the first fruit honour for Jesus, the raised saints loiter in their open tombs until Jesus himself is resurrected two days later and only then can they enter the holy city of Jerusalem and be seen by many. Embarrassing or not to thinking Christians, the risen saint's claim has had a life of its own, albeit extra-biblical. Sometime during the early centuries of the faith, Christ's descent into and harrowing of hell entered the mythology of Christianity. The Lord Jesus Christ, it seems, had spent the interval between Friday evening and Sunday morning rescuing the righteous dead from the grasp of death. And the evidence for this? Well, it was what gods and heroes always did, from at least the time of Gilgamesh onward. If they could safely visit the underworld and return, then so could Jesus. Wasn't that obvious? But it's not true, it's not history, and it's certainly astounding rubbish.